recording right now. There we go. And we'll just give a, a couple seconds for everybody to jump in here and take a minute for everybody to load in once we've got it open. Um, I'm super excited to see what Melanie has for us today. Should be pretty good. I don't think that we've ever done a webinar like this before. Have we, Melanie? No. And hopefully we can expand our topics so we get more good stuff like this. Um, we will allow for questions at the end. So I just ask that if you have a question um, mid presentation, use the Q&A button. That way we can keep track of everybody's questions in order. Um, and then we'll catch them all at the very end once all the material is through. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Melanie is amazing. She it, I, it is not me at all. It is totally all her. Um, and I, I definitely wouldn't be able to do it on my own without her. <laughs> Going pretty okay. well, thank you. It looks like our numbers are pretty much plateaued for people joining in. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, we can always have people that come in late go back and do the recap for the recording. Okay. So you ready, Beth? Yep, go ahead, okay. take away. All right, bombs away. Okay, so I am not going to unlock any great secrets of the universe today. Research, honestly, there is a lot of experience that goes with it. And when I was putting this together, I realized I just turned 50 last month. And even though the internet seems like this brand new thing, I have actually been on the internet for over half of my life now. So I have a lot of experience and I'm a very curious person. So I have had a lot of experience with looking things up. Your experience on the internet may be different. You may not have as much experience with trying to find things. If all you ever do is watch cat videos on YouTube, then you won't have as much experience, but you can learn this. I promise you can. It just takes a little time, a little effort, asking questions and just being willing to learn. Of course, there are some special things that are specific to Rev and we're gonna start with those. Your first steps are going to be looking at your project itself. You can find some information in the customer information. And then as you're doing the project, a lot of times you'll find information that will be helpful to you. A good thing to get in the habit of doing when you take on a project, first thing you do is open your project details page. And I've got a picture here. This is from Line. This is from Original Editor in the middle. And the third one is from Dash, which is the captioning editor. And in all three of those, under the project menu, you'll see project details. If you click that, you don't have to right click or anything, just click it. It will open up a new page that will have the customer information, the file, glossary terms, speaker IDs, all kinds of good things for you like that. So even though you don't necessarily need it in line, and I'll show you a screenshot of that in just a minute, it's a good idea to go ahead and open this up. It's all on one page. It's easy to read, easy to see. When you open the project details page, and this is two different ones. This is from two different projects. This one up here on the left, you can see we've got a customer name. It also had the uh, company name. So it was, you know, Bob Jones, comma, XYZ company. So that's two pieces of information right there. This particular customer had a couple of speaker names. They also had a file name here, and I blacked this one out because it had information in it. Sometimes they will actually have the title of the presentation or the person that's being interviewed or any number of items of information that might be in that file name. So take a look at that. Now you'll see this one that I've got down here in the bottom right corner. That file name is just gobbledygook. It's no use to you. It's no help whatsoever, which is why I didn't black that one out. But sometimes they will have good information for you. I've got another one here that just had the customer name, didn't have the company name. Here's the glossary. Now, one of the terms was useful. That was a company name. This particular customer interviews employees and interns of various large companies and asks them questions about working there. So this was the title of 
not title, but name of the company that these people were working for. So even if they have an accent, you know that they're talking about this company and it might help you when you're trying to figure out what they're saying. And then there are other things. Some glossaries are more helpful than others. Some, <laughs> these terms here are not very helpful, but a lot of times they can be very helpful. So all of this is in one place on one page and can be very helpful to you. And that's a great place to start any project. So try and get in the habit of opening that project details page when you start a project. But you will also find customer information in the editors themselves. Now in the middle here, this is the one I was talking about in line. You see up there next to the job number, there's a little I in a circle. And if you hover your mouse over that, this little, or maybe you have to click it, I don't remember now. This little white box pops up and it's got that same information for you, the customer name and the file name, and it will tell you whether or not their speaker names available. So you don't even have to leave the editor to find that, but that's just in line. So what you want to look for in the editors is, you see over here on the left, that little bluish greenish dot, that tells you that tab has information for you. So over here on the left, this is a project in original editor in transcription. They had a speaker name available. So that tab had a green dot on it until you clicked on it. And there's also a glossary of information there. So you click on that little tab and it opens up for you. Same thing in Dash. Those tabs there are going to have a blue green dot on them if the customer has provided information. So if they have given you information, there's no excuse for not finding it there. That you'll find speaker names if they've been provided, glossary terms if they've been provided, and sometimes customers will provide a script, especially if it's in captioning. So those can all be extremely helpful for you. But sometimes that information is not given in those sections. So what do you do then? You use information in the project to look up terms and names and just anything that you don't know. Now I will say, as I say in just about every webinar and so many forum posts and so many expert posts, use your penalty-free unclaimed window wisely when you pick up a project. I know right now we're in a slow time and it feels like I've got to get a project. I've got to hurry. I've got to do it right now. I've got to make money. But if you get 30, 40, two hours into a project and realize all of a sudden that now they're talking about things that you have never heard of, you have no clue what they're talking about, and you're going to have to spend hours and hours researching, then you've got a choice. You can either spend a lot of time researching and get the project right, which is going to reduce your earnings per hour, or you're going to have to give up the project, which means you're not going to get any money for it. And don't ever submit a project that you decide, oh, I'm no good at this. I'm not going to do the research. I'm just going to put down what I think I hear, and that's going to be good enough. No, don't do that. Make that choice. But if you use that penalty-free unclaim window first to thoroughly preview the file and find out what they're talking about, and if you know, okay, this is something I know, or I know enough about it, or there's only a couple of terms in here I don't know, I think I'll be okay with researching it, then go ahead and proceed. But if it's got a lot of stuff that you don't know, a lot of bad audio, a lot of names you don't know, maybe it's better to unclaim that and let someone else take it who can do better with it and find something that's more suitable to your strengths. So what do you do when you're in the project and you've come across something that you need to research? Well, first of all, even if you think you know something for sure, go ahead and look it up. There are so many things that we think we know. I know when I was, was first grading, I accidentally graded somebody down wrong for the wrong way of spelling Spider-Man because I thought I knew how to spell Spider-Man of all things. I was wrong. Walmart has changed the way that they 
write their names these days, their name these days. It used to be W-A-L dash capital M-A-R-T. It's not spelled that way anymore. It's all one word, no dash, no capital M. So even if you think you know it, go ahead and look it up, double check yourself, just make sure your metrics will thank you. When you're in the file, you want to use contextual clues from the file and don't just try to look up the one thing that you don't know, a person's name or some product. If you just type that one thing in, if it's popular enough, you might get some hits, but a lot of times you're not going to get any good search results for it because you're not giving the search engine enough information. So you want to do things like, you know, Bob Schmithheimer with XYZ Company and you know he's the vice president. Well, don't just put his name into Google, put in name XYZ Company vice president, put in several pieces of key information. There are several different things that this can work for. We get a lot of medical files, especially in transcription and um, sometimes captioning. We'll get some things. If they're talking about a drug name, don't just look up the drug name, look up what condition it's treating. If they're in construction and they're talking about their Sawzall and you need to look that up, look up Sawzall comma construction. So make sure you give the search engine enough information to try and put that, those puzzle pieces together and figure out what it is you're looking for. Now, another very valuable tool in files, and this is especially in captioning, but sometimes in transcription as well. If there is a video with the file, look at that video. Always look at the screen. It's so easy to get tunnel vision and you're concentrating on what you're hearing and you forget to look at what they've given you on the screen. I did it when I was new. I misspelled somebody's name and I felt so bad when I got my grade back because it was literally right there on the screen as I was typing the guy's name out. And I see that in grading a lot. It's on the screen. It's right there. There's no excuse, but I do understand it because you get so concentrated on what you're doing, you forget to use your eyes too. So be sure to check that. Especially in captioning, if it's like a TV show or a documentary or sometimes even company educational videos, they will have credits at the end sometimes or, or at the beginning. And be sure to look at those sometimes you get hung up on, well, what's so-and-so's name in this TV show? Well, if you go to the end, you'll see the credits and you go, oh, that's how you spell that. So those are good places to look for things if it's something that's going to have credits to it. And slideshows, these are a big one too. A lot of times if somebody is presenting a slideshow, then a lot of the information is going to be in those slides. Now, so in the editors, the video is about this big. It's hard to see. There are a couple of ways you can see it better and get more information. If you hover over the video, you should see a detach video that pops up in the corner and you click on that and it will pull that video out for you. And you can hover in the corner and you get a little arrow and then you can drag that arrow out and it will make it bigger. It's not going to make it huge though. If you really need to see the screen really well, the best thing to do is to create a link like you're in Linden here. And instead of posting it to the forums, then what you want to do is open an empty tab in your browser and just paste that into the URL box and hit enter. And that gives you the screen and that gives you the little square brackets full screen button. Just click that and it will go to full screen and you can see the entire thing at full screen. Sometimes it's not going to be great resolution and it can still be kind of fuzzy, but it's a whole lot easier to see that way. Now there's some general tips and tricks. Like I said, 
you're not likely to get too lucky if you're just typing in one thing, but sometimes you can, but there are ways that you can get better at searching. And I ask on the forums uh, in the social section, I said, give me your best tips. And I had a few Revers who shared some things with me. This is one that I don't ever think about using, but I know a lot of people like to use it. He's using voice search. Uh, if you have a phone or a tablet, or even if you have a microphone on your computer, you can click on the microphone on your URL box and that will bring up voice search. And so you can speak the words that you're hearing into that voice search and see if that will help Google or whichever search engine you're using, if that will help it bring it up. Sometimes you can type things and your phonetic guess is just so far off base that it's just not helpful at all. And Google just goes, oh no. But if you say it out loud, exactly like you're hearing it in the video or the audio, then Google can sometimes make more sense of it. Another thing that can be very helpful when using search engines is to learn how to use search operators. Most search engines these days are really smart and you don't have to use a lot of these, but they can still be very helpful. The two biggest things that I use are quote marks and hyphens or minus sign. If you know that somebody is quoting something and you need those exact words, if you put quote marks around the phrase that you're looking for, or if you're British, inverted commas, if you put that around the phrase that you're looking for, then the search engine knows I need to look for exactly these words in exactly this order. And this is what I'm looking for, not just these words all happen to be on the same page at the same time. I'm looking for this exact phrase. This can be very helpful with presentations, uh, medical things a lot of times, uh, lectures sometimes are reading from textbooks or from papers that particular people have written. So you might find those specific things in that specific order and that can give you more information. I also use the minus sign or the hyphen a lot of times. If you're looking up something and you're getting hits on some other topic that has no relation to what you're trying to find, then you need to subtract the things that you don't want to find. So I use this actually for recipes a lot. If I'm looking up a recipe and I know I don't have brown sugar, then I type, you know, sweet potato casserole minus brown sugar and don't put a space. It has to be hyphen and then the word that you're taking out. But you can use this for any kind of searching. If, if you're getting hits and it keeps showing you things that are unrelated, then you want to take that out of the equation. So, I mean, it literally is like an equation. You're subtracting that. So use hyphen, no space, and the term that you want to it not to look at for you. And I don't know all of these since I don't use them, but there are lots of places you can just look it up online. You can use your research skills and find out more about search operators that can help you drill down and research things better. Don't forget, this is kind of the same thing as pulling in other information, but especially with names. If you've got one person that You've had no trouble finding their name whatsoever, but you've got another person in the same file and you know they're related in some way. Maybe they're at the same company or they've presented a paper together and this person you just can't find. Then put in both names together and then it knows, OK, I'm looking for something close to this that's related to this other name. And so it's going to more likely find the person that you're looking for. Don't forget to try variations on just about anything. These days, names are just <laughs> insane. And so you may think you know how to spell Ashley or Tyler or Caitlin or any number of names, but who knows what their mom named them? So try variations. And one of the tips 
that was given in the forum post that I asked about was to use a baby name website. If you're not coming up with hits on one variation of somebody's name, try a baby name website and try some of those variations of that name and you may find it that way. And you've got to do this with company and product names. People name their companies all kinds of crazy things. I know there's a company called paychecks.com. Well, it's not C-H-E-C-K-S, it's C-H-E-X. You've got to try variations until you hit on the right one. Don't forget to use the dictionary. And that kind of goes back to that thing of, I know how to spell this. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Double check yourself. And if you're not finding something with a normal spelling, use a dictionary, and they very often will have homophones and variants of that word. And so you can look that up and go, okay, maybe it's this variation down here. And I want to say thank you to my fellow Revers who helped me out with those tips. And last of all, don't forget about the forums. They are a great place for lend an ear and for general questions. And maybe you can hear it. So you think, well, I don't need lend an ear because I can hear this perfectly clearly, but I just can't find it. So you can still use the forums for that. You can also use Ask an Expert, but remember if you do go to Ask an Expert, you only get one person. The forums, you can get multiple people who are willing to help you. So first, of course, please do use your own research skills first. Try to find it. You don't have to spend three hours trying to find one thing, but do spend a few minutes trying out some different variations, trying out combinations of things. And if you still can't get it, then please come to the forums or ask an expert and say, here's my topic. Here's what I'm hearing. I can't figure out what they're talking about. Can someone help me? Now, if you do this, just like with Lend an Ear, please do use a meaningful title on your post, not just help or Lend an Ear, and put in your sharing link and your timestamp and give information. Information is so, so, so important for people to be able to help you. Don't just say, is Zero Trust capitalized or not? Well, we don't know. We don't know what the file's about. We don't know what the context is. So give the context, tell us what you've researched and what the sentence is, what's being talked about and say, here's what I've done. Can someone help me out with this? And another thing that can be very helpful in the forums is we do have a lot of regular customers on both sides. And people do like to talk about and share information about various customers. So you might go and find something. If you go use the magnifying glass, it's up in the top right corner of the forum, a little magnifying glass and type in like the customer name or the topic. And you might find that Revers have discussed this particular customer before. And they may have information about the characters in the show or the people that are on this YouTuber's account regularly. Maybe it's a family vlog. And so there might be a post that says, well, here's all the kids' names and things like that. A specific section on both sides is called reference guides. And those are where people have typed up guides to specific customers with, with information about them. I know I've written a couple myself. Um, if you've ever seen Sorted or Barry Lewis on YouTube, they're cooking shows. They're a lot of fun, but there's a lot of terminology and a lot of people's names in those files. And so I wrote up a quick guide to here's this person and this person and this person, and here's their little song that they sing. And here are some things that they talk about. Here are some slang terms that they use sometimes. And so all of that information is in that post. And there are a lot of other reference guides that are similar. And the other information may not be in reference guides. It may be scattered throughout the forum. Like I said, just use that magnifying glass to bring those up. And 
you may surprise yourself and you may find some information already talked about. Now, as I said, learning how to search on the internet does take a lot of experience, but as you continue to work, you will get better. And if you do post on the forums, don't be afraid to ask if somebody finds it, especially if they find it in like 30 seconds. After you thank them, and don't forget to thank people, don't be afraid to ask, how did you find that? I did this, I did this, I couldn't find it. How did you find it so quickly? And a lot of times people will explain why well, I use this term plus this term. Sometimes people just know it, but sometimes people found it by searching just because they have experience and they know how to do it quickly. And so they'll be happy to share with you, oh, well, here's how I did it. And here's what I looked at. And that can help you get better at what you're doing. And don't be afraid to read other people's posts. That's something that helped me a lot when I was a young rever is just reading other posts, even if they weren't about what I was doing at the time, I learned by watching other people. And so you can do that too. Now, one other thing that I forgot to talk about was when you're researching, if you're not sure about especially capitalization, a great thing to do is to go to someone's website and don't just look at their logo, never look at logos. Logos are stylized all kinds of crazy ways, but look at how they write their company name or their product name in what we call running text. And so look for a paragraph describing this wonderful product or whatever, and look for how they capitalize it at the beginnings of sentences. If you're looking at the company name, go to their About Us page or their Contact Us page or Privacy Policy is a great page if they have one to look to see how they write it in regular everyday writing in paragraphs. So just look through websites for information like that. And there's a lot of things that we can't necessarily, like I say, it's a lot of experience, but I hope these tips will help you get started. And so now we're going to have a bit of Q&A, ask questions or share a great tip that you've got that might help other revers or share a great story about one time I had this awful file and I was so stuck on this and people helped me and here's how we got through this. So let's move to that and let's see what kind of questions you guys have and we'll see what we've got to share with each other. All right, let's take a look at the Q&A. Also, uh, I'd just like to say thank you so much for all of you that we've seen in some of our other webinars. We appreciate you coming and coming back. That's gonna help us make all these better and continue to pro provide more topics that people actually want to hear. So that's really great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Alan says, this is not formally a question, but a tip. There is a site where you can get the full script of a movie should you enjoy doing those. Melanie may cover this, but the site is, and I will paste it in the chat because I don't know if y'all can see it. Yeah, that, that's a great tip, Alan. Um, and that's one I'm not actually familiar with. So I'd love it if you post that in the captioning forums for us, because uh, there are a lot of people who do TV shows and movies and uh, co basically collect these script sites. And I don't recall seeing that one on any of the lists. So yes, those can be great things. You still need to research though, because when I have done TV shows and movies, actually I have not done any movies, but when I've done TV shows, I've still seen things that are misspelled because sometimes they're crowdsourced rather than direct from uh, the producer or the production company or whatever. So you still need to check behind those. Even if the customer includes a script with their file, you still need to check behind it because customers type things all kinds of wrong ways. Double check speaker IDs, speaker labels, double check those because sometimes it's the secretary or the intern typing this stuff in and they type it wrong or it's wrong on the screen. Even though I told you to look at the screen, double check behind the screen 
several, several months ago, back before Prince Philip of the UK passed away, one of the captioners was doing a short file about his life that was obviously a getting prepared for him passing away. They had his name spelled wrong on the screen and she double checked with her. She's like, I, I, I'm right, right? They got this spelled wrong. Am I seeing this right? It's like, yeah, they spelled it wrong. You spell it right in your work. So always double check, even if they've included things. Um, and to add on to that, uh, Alan also said to finish the tip off only to do movies when well versed in Rev. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. TV shows and movies are definitely an interesting animal. Um, <clears throat> somebody had asked earlier about checking audio quality of a project. That's for transcription only, and it's in the Find Work page next to the rest of the project details. Um, are there any cases, oh, sorry, Melanie. I was just going to say, if the question was, how does that happen, that's automatic. That's all computer stuff. <laughs> yes. Um, are there any cases where information in the project details section does not match what you searched? For example, a speaker name is listed in the project details section, and we research that speaker's name in Google search, and it gives a minor difference in spelling. Um, and I think you can see the rest there. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. So that's what I was actually just talking about. Sometimes they type it up wrong. They make a typo or it's somebody not familiar with the person. So like I said, always double check so that you have the correct information. And, but make sure that you are 100 percent certain that you are correct, that you have found the person that's being talked about and you know for sure that you have the right spelling. Okay. Um, in terms of using Lendinier when researching things or, or asking other revers, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, somebody said, my worry about using the forums is getting a response because of the different time zones. I usually log on to Rev around 5 to 6 p.m., which is around 11 a.m. our time. So when am I most likely to get a timest response? Uh, well, 11 o'clock American hours is a, uh, is a good time to be asking questions. Most Rev works on North American hours. So anything during those daytime hours, there's usually a lot of people around. So they can usually help you. Same thing with Ask an Expert. There are some of us in the UK, but uh, some of us are American. So we're on American hours, but uh, give it a try. You never know. I know there are some people, even Americans that for one reason or another, are up late or up early for them for American hours and they may be around anytime or there may be people from your own time zone who are there. There is also an option for help if you go to the help center and sign in and then look down in the lower left hand corner you'll see a little blue bubble that says support. If it has a question mark on it, then nobody is available at the moment. But if it has a little speech bubble in it, then one of the members of support is there manning the desk. And that's supposed to be available pretty much 24 hours a day. So if you're not getting a forum response or ask an expert response, you can use, probably use that as well to get some assistance. I will also say the more that you use the forum, the more you'll kind of notice patterns of when others are working around the same time as you. Right. Um, so that's helpful. Um, another one in terms of Ask an Expert, or sorry, um, Lennon Ear, you talked about the sharing link. Where do I find that? Okay, it's slightly different in each of the three different editors, but it would be under, um, I believe, help. I have all of this typed out in an automated answer, um, so I don't have to look it up each time. Uh, but it should be under like help or, um, and it's called like share audio video. So that when you click that, that automatically copies a link to your clipboard and then you just paste it in uh, to your URL or to your forum post. 
Um, there's a couple unrelated questions to research. If we have time, we'll go over some of these other questions, but for now we'll stick to the research related ones. Uh, okay. What should we do when a project specifies there's a glossary, but once you click on the link that's supposed to grant you access to it, does not show anything related to that specific, specific project whatsoever? Okay. Well, it's helpful to know uh, what kind of projects you're talking about. This can vary. If you're talking about captioning, we have a customer named Russell and Jelly. Now those are all usually pro projects. So people usually know how to get around that. But sometimes those glossary links don't go where you want them to. And, but I know other customers do as well. If it is supposed to send you to the help center and you're not getting it to open up in the help center, then you need to ask support for assistance with getting into the help center because that's very, very important. Now, if you're talking about it just get, sends you to like a Google Doc or something like that and it doesn't have anything related to the project, double check what you're looking at. If there are any folders or things like that, you know, try and go through everything. But if there's nothing in it for your project, then you're just out of luck. They added the wrong script, they added the wrong Google Doc, and there's just not anything that can be done about it because support's not gonna reach out to them and ask for the right information. So at that point, you would just proceed as if they had given no information. Now, if it's in special instructions in a yellow banner and it's not sending you to the right information, please do let support know because that's something that support has set up specifically for that customer. But if it's just in their glossary or a script attachment or something like that, just proceed as if they hadn't given you anything at all and just research like normal. Um, Penny had another tip for everybody here. The copyright line at the bottom of web pages can also help with the spelling and capitalization of company names. That's a good tip, Penny, thanks. Great tip, thank you. Every time that I notice special instructions on a project, the top of the screen will read, the customer also has some unique special instructions that differ from the style guide. Please reference these two links. The glossary link will work, but the link for the special instructions will always lead to a blank general help page that doesn't actually offer any special instructions at all. This makes me nervous as though I'm missing special notes specific to the project. Am I using the link incorrectly? Probably not. Um, first of all, sometimes people have to, when you go, when you click on a link or you copy it and paste it in, sometimes it sends you to the opening screen of the help center and you have to sign in and it should then send you to the right link, but sometimes it doesn't. So click sign in if it doesn't send you to the link that you need, then go ahead and copy it in again, try again and see if it will work. If it is not working, like I said, you need to contact support because you need to be able to get to help center articles. Because if it says there are special instructions, you have to follow those instructions and you're required to follow those instructions. And if you don't, then you will be graded down and lose points. And it's not going to fly if you say, well, I couldn't get to it, so I didn't know what to do. They're going to just tell you, well, you should have asked for help. So if you're having trouble with that and you can't get to things, please do let support know. If it comes to ask an expert, we can probably just copy it over for you, not in subtitling. And I know that subtitling for some reason just has this thing where a lot of times people just can't get access to some of the help center articles. And I don't know why. And I don't know if they've even figured out exactly why sometimes you can't get access. So it's very important if you're not getting into an article that you contact support and get the information and get them started helping you get your access restored to those articles. 
Um, let's see here. Somebody asked, uh, hi, Mel. I would like to know if I'm doing a video that's got names like cities and products from France or any other countries, what's the best way to search? I've had lots of help from London Ear, but it would be good to have a tip on that. Okay, good question. That's a one, and that was a tip, I think, that someone also mentioned in uh, the forum post that I had made was if you know you're looking up something that is from another country, make sure you put that country information in your search. So if I'm looking up something here, Google knows where I live, Google knows that I live in America, it's going to give me local results, results first, it's going to give me slightly wider geographic area after that and after that it's going to give me mostly american results but if i know i'm looking up something for a company in france then i need to put such and such product xyz company france or paris or whatever it is if you know that piece of information so always put in as much information as you can especially if you know it's in a location that's far away from where you are that's a good tip. Um, somebody else added in a, another little tip. Sometimes LinkedIn can be a good resource, not only for the person whose profile you're viewing, but also it will sometimes show colleagues' names. Also, it helps with company names. Yes, this is a great tip. And if you're concerned about LinkedIn people seeing you, you can set your privacy settings so that they won't see that, you know, okay, Bob Jones viewed your profile. I got a little freaked out about that. And I know other people have as well. They've looked somebody up on LinkedIn. And next thing you know, that person is looking at, the, at their profile. So you can set your privacy settings so that they don't see who you are. You can see a lot of information without even being logged in, not even having an account. But you can see more information if you have an account and you're logged in. So I find that a better way to find information. And I've just got my privacy settings so that they don't see who I am because I'm not looking to work with their company. I just want to know something about them and that that's all they need to know. Um, another question here, it's slightly research related for some of you that, that may know something about the medical field. What do I do when the speaker states a term that I know is incorrect? For example, I had a file the other day where the speaker said she had a colonoscopy for a cervical condition. I know that the correct procedure that she had done was a colposcopy, not a colonoscopy. Do I type what she said or what I know to be correct? I'm a nurse. She is. All right. Funny. Always, 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 no matter what, type what they say. If they make a mistake, that's on them. Now, the customer can go in if they want to correct it and change what the person actually said. They can do that on their end, whether it's transcription or captioning, both. The customer can go in and change it if they want to, but we are here. We are just recorders with fingers. That's all we are. And so type what they say always. Don't correct what a speaker says. Um, let's see here. Another one, an advice for people struggling with US English spellings, go to your browser settings and turn on spell check. It will give you the option to choose UK or US English. So you can select US English here. So that's a good tip for if you're not US based and you're having trouble trying to get the correct spellings there. Yeah. And Dash and Line and, and Original Editor do actually change most of the uh, British spellings automatically into American spellings. Now, one good thing to know is if you're talking about a proper noun, like say Her Majesty's Theater which is spelled with an R-E rather than an E-R, you don't want that autocorrecting. So if you're using proper nouns that must have the British spelling, create a text expander for those, and then it won't change those. But for your common words, your common nouns, you want to let those autocorrect as well. But I don't know that it has absolutely everything, so yeah. Uh, trying and keep your keyboard to U.S. English, that can help as well, or your, your browser, rather. Uh, we had one up here, and related to that, uh, if the slides are following British spelling and the speakers are also British, do we follow American or British spelling? Always, for 
that's the same answer. Proper nouns, follow the British spelling for common nouns. Doesn't matter what's on the screen, go ahead and spell it with American spelling. They have a thing on their end, they have a button that they can change it with one little click. They can change all of those over to their UK spellings if they want. But we as transcriptionists and captionists, captioners, we spell it American if it's a common word. Um, let's see here. I like referring back to the style guide to confirm some guidelines during a project. However, when I try to click on a link within the guide, it opens an error page. It has, has it always been like that or was it changed? If you're talking about clicking on the links to the help center in the article, that's what I was talking about earlier. Sometimes those are giving people error pages. Usually that happens if you have ever changed your rev contact email, the one that they send you know, newsletters and grades and all of that. If you've ever changed that, a lot of times that will me mess up the help center access. So all you need to do is just write in to support at rev.com and say, I've lost access to the help center. I keep getting error pages or 404 pages or whatever the particular problem is. Just write in to support at rev and they'll help you get that straightened out because you must have access to those articles. They are required reading. Uh, Lance chipped in with another tip, a tip from me for previously worked on projects. It is always good to start off looking at the project details. There are possibilities where errors and solutions to those errors are displayed, but also verify it by researching the error. That's good. If Yes, if a project has been graded and sent back to be redone, then any errors that the grader saw in the clips that they worked, those will be noted on the project details page. But as Lance points out, first of all, double check it because graders can be wrong <laughs> and double check it because, uh, well, not dub double check, but you still check the whole file because graders only see clips. They don't do the whole file. And so they may have corrected two or three things here, but there may be 20 other errors in the rest of the file that were not seen in the grading clips. So yes, that's a great place to start. It's gonna be on the left and you scroll down just a little bit. It's gonna be in that section down in the lower left. Um, somebody else had a good tip for us. This tip may have been shared. Google Maps or USPS website. Um, notes for you not in the US. That's our postal service, the nationwide one, is a huge help when streets, cities, or landmarks are mentioned and you need correct spelling. Yes. Thank you for that tip, whoever that was. Um, Alan asked, is there a resource for text expanders for a collection? No, uh, sometimes people will share their text expanders just as a way to help each other out. Here's, here's some of mine, here's some common ones, but text expanders are kind of personal. Everybody likes to write them a little bit differently. So there's not a single collection that you can just download. It's a great idea to just add one or two every day or two, just put in one or two new ones type for a couple of days, make sure you use those, force yourself to use those and practice using them. And then when you're more secure in those, then add a couple of more and just build your own because that's the best way to build it in your brain is to do it yourself. Very true. Um, we've got a few minutes left here. We'll go ahead and go through some of these questions that aren't quite research related, but they're still pretty good questions. Um, I want to test myself in laptop a few times before getting back into my rookie goings again. Please suggest what I should go for. Um, well, just the normal rookie uh, tips that we give people, stick with short projects. Now in transcription and captioning both, they have up to the minutes to a total of 200 minutes. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you should start taking big long files now you still need to stay with short files and just use that penalty free time to research well to review and preview carefully do a little research if you need to and figure out whether this is something that is going to require a lot of research or if it's going to be easy for you and then if you feel like you can do the project then get started on it but 
just the same usual rookie tips that we've given them before. Um, I will also say that we do monthly rookie basics workshops, webinars, whatever you want to call them. And we do have another one coming up this month. So I would encourage you to be on the lookout for that and come and listen to some of the tips on just getting started. And we have recordings of some of those as well, if you absolutely don't want to wait. But I, I do also recommend coming to the live ones just because it's good, because then you can ask questions and there's different things brought up that maybe weren't in the previous sessions. Um, I've seen this question a couple of times. Hi, I have just become a rubber. Is there a minimum of projects or hours required per month in order to stay a rubber? No, nope, there's not. There's no requirements whatsoever. The only thing is if you're shooting for plus, then if you're not doing a lot of work, you're not going to be garnering enough minutes to get there. Uh, you do have 120 day minutes and the commitment ratio and the on-time metric are all based on the last 120 days. So if you don't get 800 minutes in transcription in the last 120 days or 1200 minutes in captioning in the last 120 days, you won't have plus, but as far as just being a rever, no minimums whatsoever. You can come and go as you like. Okay. Um, what about uh, somebody did a transcript of a deposition and one of the speakers was labeled as a mister, but in the video, they were very clearly a female. What would you do there? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, if you mean the speaker ID, um, then, well, if, if you know for certain that this person, maybe it was Mr. Um, Mr. XYZ, but you know for certain that this woman who is speaking that you can clearly see is a woman, and that is, you know, Susan XYZ, then you would use that name. If you're talking about the Brooke Andrews, uh, Katie O'Malley depositions, those are supposed to be Mr. or Ms. last name. So if you know for sure that that is the right person with that name, then you would use the appropriate Mr. or Ms. Great. Um, Do I have any specific tips for subtitlers? Unfortunately, no. That is not something that we have much experience with. All subtitle questions that come in to ask an expert or always sent up to support. There are specific members of support who handle those questions. And trying to research in another language is just not something that I have any experience with. I did take French in high school and college, but that was before the internet. So I don't have any experience researching anything in another language. I salute you subtitlers. I, I can't imagine doing all of this captioning work and translating at the same time. That, that's just amazing to me. But it would be kind of the same thing, really. Just make sure, again, use those location tips of include the information that, OK, I know this company is in America or I know this company is in Britain. So put that information in when you're searching for it. And I know you guys do have a forum from what I've heard. It doesn't sound like it's particularly active, but um, you do have other uh, subtitlers available that you can talk to if anybody is around. So yeah, I'm sure that's very challenging. And if you're on this webinar and you are a subtitler and you'd like to try to get together some resources for other subtitlers, please email me. Um, I'll link it in the chat right now because we would love to put together more things for the subtitlers. We just don't really have anybody that can help with that currently. Yeah. But we don't, we don't want to leave y'all out for sure. Um, Jamie asked if a speaker's speech is heavily altered due to, for example, missing teeth, would you caption exactly how are they, how they are speaking for the proper word or, or the proper word or what they're trying to say? That would be a case of uh, correcting egregious mispronunciation. We don't change a speaker's grammar. We don't change if they say the wrong word. They meant to say one thing, but they said something completely different, or they didn't know what they were talking about. Things like that, we don't change. But if it's just 
bad pronunciation, like you say, because maybe they're not a native English speaker, don't change their grammar, but if they're not pronouncing it, but you know that's the word they're saying, or like you say, missing teeth, caption the, the word that is being said. How, how they say it is not as important as what they are saying. Okay, um, Erica had a question. Let's say the special instructions link doesn't work in the yellow banner of a pro video file. To clarify, if I don't get a response with the unclaimed grace period from anyone after reaching out for the help, for help with the link, and if the pay is something I'm hesitant to let go of, you're saying I should still unclaim the project, right? Most likely, yes. Um, I mean, you're going to find out before you get through the unclaim window whether you're going to get help or not. Between Ask an Expert and the forum and the help bubble in the lower right corner of the help center, somebody should be able to give you the text of that information. If it's a profile, that information is probably out there. You just need the text from that article. But if it's not there, and I know some of those wrestling jellies, they're, they've got so many different creators and some of them, their glossaries have gotten lost. There is a great forum post, and I can't remember the title of it right now, but there is a forum post where somebody put together their own uh, amalgamation of all of the glossaries for wrestling jelly. So you could also try that. And, um, but yeah, you want to do it right because if the information is there, but you don't use it, then yeah, it, you need to, you need to use the information if it is available. So, you know, they're not going to take that into consideration. If, if you could have gotten to it, then they're going to say you, you were supposed to use it. Yeah, um, we'll do one more and then we're going to go ahead and cut it off. It's uh, almost time here and I think we've covered a lot. Um, it's been good content today. Let's see here. Somebody asked um, more about being a rookie and graduating to rubber. Um, now that we don't get graded after each project, I feel that the security blanket has kind of been pulled out from under me. Do all customers give feedback or how will I know if I handed back perfect 555? Very, very few customers give feedback. Uh, I have almost a hundred, but then I do, I don't remember how many thousands of short projects I've done. So it's a very, very small number of customers who ever give feedback. So don't ever count on that. Always submit your best work. Assume that you're going to be graded and give what you believe is a 5-5 project, always. It may get graded, it may not. And so if you treat every project exactly the same as if you know you're going to be graded on this project, then you should do well. And I know it's kind of scary when you're a new rever and now you're not getting the feedback that you're used to, but just keep working, keep working hard, keep asking questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions while you're working. And you can ask on the forum, you can use experts and we'll be glad to help you out. But just do your best each time. Okay. Well, that's all the questions we're gonna cover for today. Again, thank you so much everybody for coming. I really appreciate every sh everybody showing up and helping us to grow these. And also special thanks to those of you that went out of your way to share your special tips because that's what's helping everybody else. And, and that's really um, that's really priceless to other rubbers. All right, we'll put the recording up. It should be up by the end of this week. I'm hoping we will put captions on it. So just keep a lookout for it in the forum as well as the Help Center and the YouTube channel. Thanks everybody, we'll see you at the next one. All right, bye everybody.